Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Last show to do. So, hi everyone. I'm Jussi. Uh, Jussi Eronen, uh, Juhani. Call me Jussi, everyone does. Uh, and I'm here to talk about vulnerability handling in a large scale, in a massive scale. That's vulnerability handling for the masses. So, uh, I started out in vulnerabilities back in 99. Uh, there was a universal research, re research group up in Oulu, OUSPG. We did something that was, we tried to call robustness testing, but everyone else started to talk, uh, talk about fuzzing, so that's what it is. And I think the first vulnerability I found out was actually in iCalendar. So if you looked at Mikko Turmio's presentation earlier, those are still bound. Uh, and we had the idea back then that finding bugs is pretty hard, finding vulnerabilities is pretty hard, and that's why you need to have an engineering approach to finding vulnerabilities. Turns out uh, finding vulnerabilities was actually pretty easy. It still kind of is. And uh, my research problem turned into, okay, what now? Now that there are all these vulnerabilities out there. And that brings me nicely, looks, like, looks as though I, I planned it, but I didn't, to NCSC FI, to National Cyber Security Center, Finland, where we think about, okay, what do we do now that we know that we have all these vulnerabilities? Uh, I'm not going to do an intro on on NCSC. Suffice to say that this is our goal. It's an old slide from Erka, who might be there somewhere. Uh, uh, but the idea, general idea is that we work towards a safer internet. And well, our mandate is in Finland, so mostly safely, safer Finnish internet. Uh, I looked at our case handling repository, uh, and we do get all kinds of reports. So I'll have to cheat a bit here. You'll, you'll understand in a while. So in recent months, we had denial of services, service dist dist disturbances. Some of them are maintenance breaks, actually, but they are reported as disturbances. Unwanted marketing, cookie-related issues, spam, spam spreading malware, sextortion scam, O365 phishing, bank phishing, other forms of phishing, Whaling, CEO fraud, business email compromise, SMS spam, MMS spam, number forgeries, international revenue share fraud, other types of telecom fraud, WAN giri calls, tech support scams, investment scams, dragon den, dragons den scams, romance scams, subscri uh, subscription traps, other kinds of social media scams, web shops, uh, fake web shops, digital skimming, information stealers, coin miners, other kinds of malware, botnets break-ins, data leaks, key management mishaps, targeted attacks, and, well, that's probably not all of it, but that's what I could discern from it. So, in our case, it's pretty easy, actually, to, like, think, forget about vulnerabilities, or think that vulnerabilities aren't as in important. But the fact is that, in, even in those cases, vulnerabilities do play a role, in some cases, a major role. So, I'm going to speak about vulnerabilities from our context, and the case might, might not be all that familiar to some of you, but I think it's all good fun anyway. Mostly, when, when search guys talk about vulnerabilities, you see a chart, something like this. Uh, this is a vulnerability handling standards. In the middle, there are two standards for vendors on vulnerability disclosure, how to get reports in, how to handle them, and on the right side, how the vulnerability handling process go goes after the initial disclosure. The ISO folks helpfully have disregarded the role of the, of the reporter, the researcher, but I amended this chart with the ones from CERT-CC who should know their thing. They've been handling vulnerabilities since 1988, the Morris worm. So there's a researcher who discovers something, reports it maybe through a coordinator, and this is the part where I advertise that, hey, we do this also. If you find a vulnerability, you suspect something, 
you can contact us. But I'm not going to talk about any of this, this part. So I'm not a vendor. I'm not going to talk about our coordination, uh, triage, anything like that. I'm going to talk about what happens after all of this, after the fix has been done or in some other way the vulnerability data is published. Uh, after that, we get into the realm where the defenders should deploy the fixes because the attackers are already starting to exploit them. For the uh, end users, there's another cycle. There are lots of graphs related to this one. I used one from Gartner basically because it has all these, ni all these nice icons. So basically, uh, event, uh, target or a defender should assess uh, the infrastructure and see whether this vulnerability poses a threat to them, has have a list of prior uh, vulnerabilities, prioritize them at context, then act to do something, or well, well accept the risk not to do something. Uh, there are no songs for the other icons. I wish there were. So we have a song for accept the risk, but maybe we should have for the rest of them. And after that, they should check whether it worked, basically, and then improve the cycle, you know. There are, of course, there's a whole industry trying to help defenders with this. There's attack surface management, uh, vulnerability data exchanges, uh, scanning services, and so on and so forth. So, what's the problem? Why am I, why am I still here? It's because, th because of this. Well, this is one of, just one example from a couple of weeks ago. There was a vulnerability two years ago, and uh, it was uh, related to VMware ESX instances. You needed to have a port open, not only to have a vulnerable service, but also to misconfigure it, to have a port open that somebody could exploit it. And still, hey, we have a huge problem. So in spite of everything that people are doing, we still have issues. Finland had, I think, 90 of these servers, mostly because of the data centers in Finland, though. So it was not a big deal, but oftentimes these are. So that's why I'm talking about vulnerability handling for the masses. In order to keep the internet safe, in order to keep the Finnish internet safe, we have to take care of this part. We have to remove vulnerable systems from the, from the internet. And uh, as, a, as a cert, we are pretty well uh, worse to handle, handle this. I'm not going to talk about a law, the law a lot. I have a few legal slides. This one is there to demonstrate that we actually have a capability written in the law that says that we can, uh, if need be, force the removal of system that causes hindrances to the, to the network. So, yeah, we can do this. That's why we, well, should do this all the, all the more. Obviously, we can't, it's not Pokemon, we can't catch them all. We can't remove all of the vulnerabilities from the, from the internet. So we have to focus our efforts. We, well, we have a lot of people nowadays, but even though we can't really uh, do anything about all of this, which ones do we start from? The obvious ones are the ones that you see from the media, the vulnerabilities such as the ESX, ESX vulnerability. There will be reports all over, so it's a no-brainer. We should look into that. We should prioritize that, probably. At least investigate it. But what about the others? Uh, I'm pointing out a couple of, uh, a couple of resources. One is the uh, CISA, well, our colleague agency, from, from the US that has a catalog of uh, vulnerabilities that are under active exploitation, the known exploit, exploited vulnerabilities catalog. If something rises up to here, it usually means that there's attack activity, there is, uh, proof of concept, uh, there is more than a proof of concept ex exploit, and that's a, pr uh, a priority. On the other thing, there is the uh, EPSS score, which basically says that uh, these are the exploit prediction scoring system. That's where it comes from. Basically means that these are the vulnerabilities that are more likely to be exploited in the coming, uh, coming 
days, weeks, months. So these are kind of like the hints to prioritize vulnerabilities. So where to start from? So in order to def de defend Finland, we need to know what Finland is. And well, th in this case, it's nowhere near on a map. So what is Finland in the scope of networks? Uh, the basic answer on ans uh, the basic answer from what is Finland starts from routing. If a packet finds a way to the Finnish networks, then well, there's a routing uh, relationship somewhere, and uh, we know the owner of the of the networks that are are in the routing network called the autonomous systems. If we know the, if we know of the uh, networks that belong to Finnish operators, Finnish companies, uh, well, we can track those and we can track from a router real time which networks they, do, they have and well, so on. So a basic methodology as actually, as it started, was to print out the list of all the ASS and okay, this sounds Finnish, let's put it in the list. Uh, this sounds like something that is crucial to the functioning of the Finnish critical infrastructure of the society. So, okay, we should be, we should put that on the list. And currently, well, not currently, it was Monday. On Monday, this meant that there were 245 autonomous systems that we mostly are interested about. This is probably should be refreshed it should be refreshed more often than we do to be more, uh, to be really frank they have uh something like 1300 ip ranges or ciders uh ranging from slash 14 to slash 24 i think and that amounts to an ip space of close to 15 to 16 million ip addresses and uh that is disregarding the fact that does it, that uh, tries to ab uh, account for the fact that some of the autonomous systems are not exclusive to Finland. We try to only take the Finnish IPs, but in some cases that's difficult. We are trying to look into other things besides. Uh, you could of course look at the map. You could look at different GeoIP servers, services on what is Finland, what is Finnish, and we kind of do. For example, it's no secret that we do a lot of work with some of the internet superheroes such as the Saro server and they send us two files each day. This is the Finnish geographic region and this is the Finnish, uh, these are all the problems that we see from the Finnish geographical region and these are the Finnish ASN, ASN. so they are two different things. Uh, we could look at all the different reg registries, uh, for example the RIPE Huis database the problem with that is that it contains a lot of outdated data. For example, many of the state networks are registered under, under a VTKK, the state uh, computer center, which ha was a thing until 1992. So the, it, it hasn't existed in this century, but it's still there in the record. So that's kind of like doubtful. Uh, there are services that try to clean it up. We've been looking into those periodically and see that, okay, well, we can take those things. But usually uh, it doesn't really, we should uh, <laughs> update that continuously because the network changes. I'll have a ex concrete example of that later. We could look at domains.fi.ax. That's an work in progress actually, uh, where the actual domains are located and try to look at their vulnerabilities. Uh, we are in the process of gathering .com, .net, .whatever and looking at Finnish brands from there. Uh, you can look at passive DNS uh, certificate, certificate transparency list for the things, uh, subdomains for example, to, to the domains that won't appear in the TLD lists. Uh, Jonas workshop uh, earlier today had some great resources in on the, how, how to actually do this. Uh, you should check those, uh, you should check their slides if you're interested in this. We've been gathering cloud infrastructure with the help of our partners. So basically saying to companies that if you want us to give you better service, uh, please 
let us know in real time which cloud IPs you are using. And we've been scanning those, for example, in, in the case of Log4Shell. So we could look at, are there any obvious entry points for that vulnerability? We are having a new project looking at the supply chain, basically trying to figure out whether we should prioritize uh, providers that uh, people are using. For example, you could look at DNS TXT records and work your way from there. But there's a lot of stuff, and we are trying to explore all of that. But we already had a list of 15 to 16 million IPs, so there's quite a lot to work with to, to, to begin with. The next obvious question, the next obvious questions is about, uh, you didn't talk about IPv6, and uh, which of these IPs are actually used? Well, there's a comparison. I've been using two commercial services, Shodan and Census, which are basically IP search engines, to look at how many IPs they currently have in their databases. I've been having the privilege of looking at raw, da raw scanning data from each of these services, and I performed a countrywide search for top 100 ports in, as specified by Nmap on Monday. And here are the, here are the numbers. So Shodan says that there's like uh, one and a half million uh, IPs that are used. Census, for some reason, says that there are only 600,000, although the raw data from only less than two months says has a figure similar to Shodan. And from the Shodan historical data, you can see that these resources actually vary surprisingly much. So I wouldn't have thought that uh, in the data spanning four years, there are two and a half million unique IPs. So that means that the IP blocks have shifted from there here to there. And the, uh, that's why you need to stay updated. You need to have current data all, all the time. And our data from 100 top boards are 1,300,000 answered. So that's roughly the ballpark of the post that we are looking at. So, okay, we have selected the vulnerability. Uh, we know wh roughly what we should scan. How can we find the vulnerable systems? So, the rough methodology is that I usually start with the third-party systems uh, trying to further prioritize on whether, okay, this is a vulnerability, which is a problem. Is it a problem for us? Is it a problem for, to, for Finland? And then work from there. Let's take a hypothetical vulnerability. No, not a hypothetical, a random vulnerability. Uh, this is from Oracle. I selected Oracle because I can never make heads or tails about Oracle advisories, like 400 CVs and all kinds of products I've never heard of. So that's why I picked Oracle. And Oracle SBase, I had no idea about this one. Uh, so, okay, it's a 10. It's a very serious vulnerability indeed. Let's try to, to use this met methodology. How to find Oracle SBase? Okay, I'll start from things like installation instructions, uh, videos, uh, Google searches, stuff like that. So here's the, here's the first hit, says that it has an Apache Tomcat, I'm feeling bad already. Uh, and it follows up by saying that, okay, it uses, agent uses port 124323, I have no idea what an agent is in this context, but it doesn't matter. Uh, there's an server which has a thousand ports, okay, I'm not looking at the ports, uh, but there's ESSS VR, and then there's a services server which uses one port. Okay, I can work with those. There's something I can work with. So let's start doing this. So the first search, uh, confusingly on the bottom, ESSS VR doesn't have any results. So okay, well, that was a tough one. Uh, port one for two, three, Shodan says uh, 12 results, and Census says 256 results. And I've used the search term service truncated false, which according to web law says that this should get rid of many of the honeypot hits because in the honeypots, the uh, search hits are truncated because there's so many of them. But it doesn't actually do a very good job with it. So there's a lot of honeypots and other things I shouldn't care about. So not good searches. 
another thing why we sh are seeing this discrepancy between shoulder and the senses is that, according to my observation, senses has a more much wider port range. So in some tests that I looked at, Shodan looked at like 8,500 ports, whereas Census looked at pretty much the whole TCP port space, 65,000 ports. So that might be a reason why there are more hits. I don't know. S-Base, uh, you can actually see that many, uh, well, you can't see here because I wanted to make the text big enough for you to see it, uh, is that the first hit is in an Oracle network and there was actually majority of the hits were in Oracle network. So we are up to something probably here. But uh, yeah, it's a thing. It's not a thing for me. It's, an or it's a thing for Oracle and it's their problem. Uh, looking at Shodan, there's like 187. And well, doesn't look like there are any hits uh, in outside of France in Europe. Uh, so probably not a, not a problem for us. And last one was the uh, port 3388. There, were, there was a lot of that. I added the tag Oracle because there's, it's an undefined port. It's an ephemeral port. There's all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff on that port. So you need to first put in Oracle or something to specify the search. And then you get the honey parts and then minus tag honey parts if you have the enterprise license to show down, which you need at this point or then download all the hits and uh, work your way from there. Raw data is nice, raw data is nice. And uh, then you get to see that, okay, 40 hits and probably not in Finland. In the, in the uh, in census, we saw more hits on this as well. I'm assuming it might have to su do something to do with the way they scan. Both of these do rolling scans and from my empirical, not statistic observation, it looks like that census does one set of networks, the next week another set of networks, the next week another set of networks, and it kind of like works smoothly away ac across all the IP space. Whereas Shona is like, okay, I'm scanning, I'm scanning, I'm scanning, I'm scanning. And it's like very difficult to follow up on what's actually happening there and which ports from which host it scans. The other thing is that you know that they can't scan everything all the time. So some of the results might be quite dated. And that's a problem because, well, the last thing I want to do is to alert something about someone about something that's not a problem. So I want to know when I send emails to somebody saying that, hey, you have a problem. I want to make sure that they actually have a problem. It does not mean, not, doesn't do me good, much credit otherwise. And that's why the next phase would be a port scan. Um, I'm not going to go into the port scan methodology a lot. Uh, it's because, well, it's basic. Everyone is doing it the same way. We don't, haven't, we don't have a silver bullet here. So first use something that can handle a lot of networks quickly, zip map, mass scan, then use something that finds the thing you need, Zgrab or Nmap or custom scripts or what have you. So that's basically how we do it. Uh, again, C search cell scan the networks pretty soon. Everyone in in Europe, all the C search in Europe should scan. There are lots of legal debates surrounding scanning, whether it's good, whether it's bad. I like the fact that the, the EU says that everyone, all the C search should scan and it's mandatory pretty soon in uh, Network and Information Ser Services Directive. Uh, so that fixes the situation, that should fix the situation for us. But there's still, uh, I would like the legal situation. This is my moment on the soapbox now. So I would like the situation for ev the rest of us, the rest of you to be much clearer in the future. So Netherlands has made uh, pretty clear statements about what kind of testing is uh, accepted. Uh, Belgium recently apparently said that testing is okay, period. Uh, so I'm not sure on how th that will pan out, but I'm, what I'm sure about is that we in Finland should have some kind of position ab about what is accepted 
uh, in, in, in vulnerability research. Thank you. Because, well, the fact of life is that the bad guys will scan. If you try to stop the good guys from scanning, what good will it do? So we should be better. All right, that was the scanning part. Now, now we have an idea that, OK, this is probably a X system. Is it vulnerable? OK, how do you determine if it's vulnerable? The easiest way, the ideal way, would be to look at the version number and determine from there, well, was it the patch version or not? So there are many easy cases, many, many software that make this easy. Uh, for example, Exchange has, the, I th I'm, uh, at least two ways. I think there are three ways that I know of, but I lost the third one, sorry for that, uh, that have a version number where it's readily available in HTTP and HTML. And these are good, of, again, because you can search, look them up in Shodan in census, except when they are right on the bottom of the page, because more, I think at least Shodan only indexes the first X bytes of the page. So if the version number is there, you're, you're out of luck. But um, it's, if it's in the HTTP address, you'll see it anyway. Confluence had it on the bottom of the page, but I think uh, the page wasn't long enough, so you could look for it. So good cases. Uh, a couple of bad cases, There's, there would be many, 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 many examples here. Uh, SharePoint, there are a couple of files that I'm told contained a version number, but they are never available. Everyone blocks access to these files. It's probably all the better. Uh, they've kept, they probably have thought that, OK, those are dangerous resources, and there are a lot of other dangerous resources that you shouldn't be able to reach. And well, that's probably good. Uh, Microsoft DNS is, is, is nice because, well, DNS specifies that you can do a chaos uh, query where you are supposed to have the version number of the DNS server, and it does. It does have a version number 6.4, example here, 6.0.6003, and then the magic number in the parenthesis. The magic number in parentheses, I have no idea what the first numbers are about, but the last numbers are hexes that correspond in, bin in decimal to the last build numbers, which you can find by clicking clicking on Microsoft pages endlessly until you find which versions are, are related to any version. So, well, it's kind of there, but it kind of isn't. And of course, there's, there are a lot of expe expectations to the rule. So uh, I mentioned Confluence as a good example. It's also a bad example because they had hot patches for vulnerabilities that don't change the version number. So yeah, that kind of screws things up for me. Uh, of course, everyone knows about uh, operate, uh, free operating systems that do backports of patches. So they are at this version, but this patch applied. And it's kind of manageable, but it still makes things pretty hard for defenders. Uh, as I mentioned, the version numbers might not be indexed by Shodan census uh, at all. At some point, uh, the third-party services know that this is an Oracle system and might all readily give you the version number and have you like service.oracle and version number, and you can do searches like that, like this. I forgot to mention it earlier, uh, but I'll, I'll do it now. I love, like the fact about census is that it has documentation. Uh, it adheres to the documentation. It actually works the way it's documented. And uh, there are many, there are a great many tags that you can search for, and you can do Boolean searches. So it's like a production product. It's like something that's like supported for you. Shodan is cool. Shodan is great. Uh, it has a lot of creative insight. You can search for vulnerabilities. You can, the tags are nice, but it kind of like works the way one guy intended and well, he's not very being very 
uh, precise about things. So it's like dog and pony show compared to census, but I still like the show. Uh, in many cases, it's considered best practice to omit version numbers. And this is one thing that I'm kind of like doubtful in the current day. Because, well, as far as I understand it, attackers will attack you anyway. So there are people that will package every, any vulnerabilities they have. Yeah, so if, if it would increase the work of attackers omitting version number, it would be good. But I'm kind of like having the idea that currently there are, there's so many attackers that just try to try everything against you. So if you omit version numbers, they still try it against you. So it's, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure how much that will accomplish. Whereas omitting version numbers will mean for you that you will need to do the extra work to determine whether, what your version number is. So if you do omit the version number, make sure that your inventory of assets is accurate. And let's be honest, nobody has an accurate asset inventory. So in, yeah, 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 yeah. if you do, well, it's good for you. But the rest of you, well, you don't. <laughs> so in case the version detection fails, then you need to do something scary. You need to actually try to exploit something in order to see if it's vulnerable to the exploit. And well, at us being public servants, we, that is kind of like the thing that we have to obey the law, you know. So we can't really commit any crimes. And that kind of makes things tricky. Uh, most of the um, POC scripts that are out there try to do uh, one, of two, one of two things. One is remote code execution, the other is uh, try to get credentials. And this is the, uh, an example of the latter. It's a CVE for Apache two years ago. And uh, it's a very simple garden variety uh, path traversal attack. And the example says that, hey, you should probably head for the password file. And this is what the attackers will, well, this, the, what the piece of POC writers will want to do because they want to demonstrate that this is a good, bad attack. And well, that's a password file for you, you have, uh, that haven't seen one before. So it currently say, says that these are the users and these are some parameters of them. And um, I installed, often when I have the possibility, when there's a vulnerability, I try to get the vulnerable version, install it somewhere in the Docker container. And the top part, is the uh, vulnerable version, and the bottom part is the fixed version. Well, you can see it for the version numbers there also. So um, you you can see <laughs> you can see from there that the uh, vulnerable version says when you try to probe for the file, it says 200, and the non-vulnerable says 400, and that's something that you can use. So simple as that. Uh, in this case, you could, of course, look for something that ETC, something other than the ETC password, but make sure that it's a file that is in all the Linux distributions, and there aren't many of those. And uh, in this example, I used the head request, which is to say, just tell me the status code, don't send me any data. And I think that's pretty safe in this, in this context. So that's a very simple example on that. Um, OK, in most cases, our story would end here. But in, there are instances of the vulnerability coming out at the point that it's already known by someone, it's already used in the attacks. So you need, we, need, we want to take that into account. So as an, as an example, there was the exchange vulnerability a couple of years ago uh, where a threat actor called by Microsoft as Hafnium had already, uh, well, basically, they found a vulnerability by, by the virtue of looking at these compromises. And there were already many compromised servers, servers out there. So we had already, because this is a cooking show, this, I'm, I, I have done already 
the dish and I'm taking it out of the oven. So I had already taken all the steps that uh, I had discussed previously. And this is the message that we sent out there. We identified vulnerable systems and as soon as we could determine that, okay, we know what we're talking about, send the message out there that you are vulnerable, check the patch levels. And there was a mention about, okay, these have been already used in the attacks, but it was not the crux of the message. The crux of the message was that you are vulnerable according to what we know. Uh, at the same time, as the as Microsoft publication, there was a, a, another publication from a company called Huntrex that had a list of 358 web shell names. So basically the attacker, attack works so that the attacker had a specific payload which was inserted in the web root and then they had a China chopper backdoor which is basically one line of PHP that is there. Username and password you need to know in order to execute PHP code of your choosing on the server. So we knew that okay, if something is vulnerable it might have one of these web shells. So here is where we used uh, Jonas excellent fast faster you fool tool to look at all the parts, all the web cell parts that we knew of, which amounted to something like six to 700. Look at all the vulnerable systems and all the parts that might contain a web shell in case the attackers are lazy and reuse the web shell names and try to determine from there if it says 200 from there, it's probably uh, compromised because there's a web shell there. Oh, well, they have a funny configuration, but well, that's their fault. Uh, and there was another uh, case, another set of servers that uh, sent back a 500 re reply, which we then comp through by hand to see for additional vulnerabilities. And we were able to send another set of messages to these compromised, uh, uh, compromised host owners saying that your host is compromised. So some of them cut first your vulnerable message, then a period of delay where we, while we figure out how to scan the rest of them and you are compromised. So it came, that escalated quickly for them. And here the message was different. The, the, uh, basic idea was that, hey, you need to check for the signs of compromise, remove the compromise, clean your systems, reinstall your systems. So it's a very different, different signal. And we are sending these messages mostly through operators. So basically, we don't know the customers of an ISP, say Telia DNA, Elisa, they do know the customers. So we send this to operators and say that, hey, you know your customers, please contact them with these messages. In some cases, uh, there are also compromises already happening, but there isn't, there isn't a nice blog post about them. We just know that there are attacks and there are compromises. An example is uh, this case from Confluence, uh, where actually, if I remember correctly, they issued an advisory, but they neglected to say in the advisory that, hey, this is a remote code execution. Re you, need, you really, really, really need to do something now. Instead says that, yeah, yeah, there's an update, there's a vulnerability. <laughs> and well, that's, it's only natural that many people didn't update. And then they revised it and said that, hey, this is a serious business. By that time, all compromises were all, all, already occurring. Uh, there was a nice person uh, who might be there in the audience today, I'm not seeing him, uh, who had <laughs> system, uh, very, very well, well monitored system with customers and one of the customers neglected to update uh, their system. Uh, and because the system was so well monitored, he, we, could, we saw everything from this compromise. This was a nice case. Uh, so we saw the audit logs, the access logs, the uh, GRXec logs, what was executed on the server, uh, how the web server was attached. Uh, there was a sample of the PCAP related to this compromise. Uh, all the files that were dropped there, 
the cron tabs that were installed. And it's just like, okay, I've been handed a case on silver platter. I better make sure that I handle this one well, because, well, I have all the necessary details. So the first thing to do is to uh, put this, uh, well, yeah, here you have Kinsing, which is an executable file, as you can see from, the, from here. There's a, there's a library, and some of, some of you probably noticed that there's an XMRIG binary there as well. So you, I put, put the Kinsing sample uh, in, the, in Joe's sandbox, in one, well, in any of the sandbox. It says, here you can't see that it says that it detected an XMRIG because it's, well, the color seam is screwed, but it says that it detected a XMRIG cryptocurrency miner, and it says that it's a Trojan or BART. So there's probably a backdoor component to all of this. So, okay. Let's go back into investigation mode, try to determine whether they are backdoors that are still active in Finland. From the PCAP, we could see that uh, it has a CNC and it communicates to the CNC. And the thing that it communicates is something that looks garbled, so probably encrypted in some form or, an, or, or, or another. I, I have to, uh, I have a whole slide set about reversing this malware, but there's a lot of stuff today, so I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, it was a Go binary, and after working with that fact and using all the necessary tools, you could massage it to the point where you can see that there is an HTTP RC4 key content uh, variable, which is kind of like a telltale sign that there's an RC4 encryption, and this might be the key. And sure enough, if you put it in CyberSeph, and take the uh, binary payload from the PCAP, use this key. It says that here is a port number, here is a username and password. So basically, it opens a backdoor channel on that port, and these are the credentials used to go there. And armed with that knowledge, uh, we could see that, uh, we could look it up in Shodan and Shodan doesn't index port, port, port 31458, so we could think that, okay, everything's well. We could look at its census, where, where, which actually does search for this port, and <laughs> then see that, okay, there are some uh, in the world, none in Finland, and the ones that are out there in other countries mostly look like honeypot, so not a, probably not a big problem. We could also do a lot more. So that's basics, but that's basics of vulnerability handling, and that's usually everything that we do and then some. But in some cases, we've actually managed to do some more and other certs in the world even, be even better. In the exchange case, uh, Matthias was one of, the, one of the people who coordinated uh, an effort where we contacted everyone that had not patched their systems after a couple of days. So we had like five people calling everybody on the phone that, hey, you have a vulnerable exchange system, and it's, they are being popped left and right. Uh, these are, in Finnish, these are actual screenshots. I've uh, blocked out the victims from there. It's like email service, uh, service uh, breached there's a lot of stuff. They are uh, returning the backup, making security checks, making updates. This is uh, another one. This is a Linux server, false positive. Uh, they'll check again. Oh, it was a Windows server. Okay, now it's fixed, <laughs> according to Shonen. They didn't bother calling us back. The last one was uh, the sad story. It was breached. The whole environment had been rebuilt. It's all under control. I hope so. Uh, in some cases where we are the coordinator of a vulnerability, we can uh, try to prepare for the impact of the vulnerability. This is from 2014, the Heartbleed vulnerability, uh, found by Neil Mehta of Google and co-found by uh, Finnish security company, uh, then called Konamikon. You know, some of you know, know the story. It was published on the 7th of uh, March. March? I'm pretty sure that's, that's April. 
Yeah? April, yeah. Yeah, so here. And this is a pretty typical-ish cycle with us. So first we have bad scanner that sees only these. We improve the scanner, then we see, okay, it's, it was a bit bigger problem than we initially saw. And then it starts to decline. In this case, there was a, qu a quick initial decline and after that a long tail. And that's like, that's usual. We all, always have long tails. In this case, uh, what we were able to do was that we took this scanner that we had ourselves built. There were, there were a lot of hard bleed scanners out there. All of them were faulty, so we built our own, one of our own that was iteratively better. And uh, then we were able to see more as, as seen here. So we packaged it, we built it into a virtual machine and gave it to the government that, hey, this is very serious. Please make sure to check your internal networks also. So I wish that we could have time to do more and publish these things also. The other thing that we could do while preparing for the vulnerability was that uh, we had analyzed it. We knew how the vulnerability could be exploited. We knew that it was a stealthy vulnerability. There would be no markings on logs about attempted exploits. So we built uh, IDS rules for for our early warning system, Havaro. We actually had also a small honey net trying to monitor for any incoming connections. And, sh and we didn't see anything until the 8th, at which point there was a lot of scanning for Heartblade. So if you are coordinating a vulnerability, and it's a network-based vulnerability, uh, we didn't want to scan the internet for it because that would reveal to someone that, hey, what are these strange packets and leak the vulnerability in the worst case. But you can still monitor for it and you can see, see, still see if it's in the wild. So that's, that's a nice thing, nice thing to do. Uh, a couple of our uh, colleagues are doing remediation packages. For example, here is a recent one from CISA, our, co our US colleagues that built a recovery package from the ESX ransomware. JP3CC in Japan are prioritizing malware that gets installed on computers and there are removal guides from those. So that would, that would re, uh, reduce the risks even further if we could do more of that. Okay, um, so I'm feeling a bit like a uh, salesman. One more thing, there are actually two, mo two more things, but one more thing, I tried to, those, that was basically the end of, end of the, uh, end of the major part of the presentation, but I want to introduce a couple of problems that we haven't figured out in, in hopes that you will figure something out about them and you will fix these yourselves. One of, one of the problems that we've often talked about is IoT and crappy IoT, home routers more specifically, one of the biggest, one of the big problems. Uh, today, uh, I think that's gotten better, at least as far as home routers are concerned. So operators see that it's their problem if they hand out crappy home routers and uh, their, custom, their customers become uh, compromised. And those have gradually gotten better, at least on the internet facing side. On the local network side, they sti might, still might keep, keep be crap, but most of the traffic, attack traffic comes from the internet. On the other hand, uh, that could change. In Brazil, they already have had for some years uh, web-based compromises where a malicious payload is inserted on a web page, which uh, contains JavaScript that tries to enumerate through the local network all the default web pages of all the home routers, all the management uh, interfaces, and tries to change the DNS settings there. If you don't have CRS, CSRF protection there, as many of them don't, uh, well, you're screwed. In, in the case of Brazil, uh, the bad guys are looking for a way to make an easy buck, and in this case, they might only change your DNS settings so that they can serve you ads 
instead of other ads, instead of the ads that you would normally see. So they get ad revenue, uh, criminal ad revenue. I didn't know that was a thing until some, uh, some years ago. So that's kind of like your garden variety criminal uh, doing something. But it has a uh, darker side. This has been going on for some years now that uh, the more determined criminals have noticed that many of the companies are not using home routers, they're using small office routers. And boy, those are crap. So <laughs> there, was a, uh, there are a lot of uh, old vulnerabilities that are existing in gear or from these vendors. The product listings are huge. Uh, many, of the, many of these are uh, out of date. So end of life uh, devices, and well, they will sit there until the hardware breaks, basically, un un until you do something. And there are a lot of uh, APT kind of malware that try to do things with these. There's an added nice benefit for the criminals. When I said that the Brazilian criminals don't really do anything advanced, they might at this point, but they at least didn't used to do. Now that they are between you and the internet, they are actually in the adversary, in the middle position. And suddenly all the vulnerabilities you didn't care about, like uh, uh, doing proper crypto, things that uh, require the, uh, the middle position, that they actually become exploitable there and they can do a lot of stuff. They can of, of course also move to your internal LAN network, which was protected and you can do Crap, crappy uh, soft stuff there. So that's a scary proposition. And I, I don't have a good solution because the, uh, oh, from the point of view of the users, nothing bad has happened yet. <laughs> so they are at risk, but they don't see the risk as very, very big one. Uh, even, though, even though the uh, Finnish intelligence service has also issued, issued a warning about this. It see, still seems quite a hard message to get through. The last thing, I promise this is the last thing, is that uh, there is uh, yet more problems with the definition of vulnerability. So a misconfigured server, Many people don't consider that a vulnerability. Uh, it's been raising up in a couple of presentations here. Uh, it will be uh, trouble for you, although it's not a vulnerability. Another one is an open service, often combined with a misconfiguration. So as you probably know, the denial of service attacks have increased. Uh, well, at least high profile denial of service uh, attacks have increased in Finland recently. And the thing that the targets usually do first, the most effective stupid thing to do is to say that, okay, we don't accept traffic from outside Finland. Okay, the attack traffic mostly comes from outside Finland and then the attack, attack, attack traffic doesn't cut, get to you and you can serve your Finnish customers. Uh, that's probably not a good idea for many of, the, many of the targets, but still it's been done. And it's like, okay, we took care of the problem. But then we have uh, the case of uh, application attacks. Everyone uh, probably knows about these. So especially in the case of UDP, where there is no real connection between client and server, you can send X one byte to get, like in case of NetBIOS, 3.8 bytes to the target of your choosing, and in extreme cases like 51 kilos to the target of your choosing. And if we combine this fact with the fact that there are many open services within Finland, uh, you could actually do a denial of service attack towards Finnish targets from within Finland by targeting these servers. Like we have, these are old figures. I, I was lazy. I didn't update them. Sorry for that. It's like, okay, we have 10,000 open port mapper instances. We have like 700 SSDPs. We have 142 memcached. And it's very really hard to communicate to users that, hey, you need, you, 
that's not good for you. You will get bitten by this, or you will cause harm to others because of this. And uh, the powers of taking down servers because they have an out, uh, open service seems a bit draconian. So how to communicate this effectively, that a, a, a target could have an application factor of 8 million by using these from within Finland, and the traditional defenses would stop working. So that's a message that we, as a community, I think, should get through to system owners. And now this was the last thing that I had, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I was promised that I can still accept questions, although it's late. <laughs> you can also, I'll be around, you can just grab me by the... <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, really good presentation. Um, question. Do you have any uh, follow-up procedure, mechanism, or escalation path if someone simply doesn't react and, and we still think they're causing a problem to the finishing uh, uh, network? Yeah, yeah. so the, uh, in case of malware, it's pretty clear. I'll have to specify that, we'll start with that. If you have malware, uh, we have automated systems that will nag the operator and they will nag at you and then threaten with uh, cutting you off the internet, and that will sort itself out at some point. Uh, in case of vulnerabilities, we aren't quite there yet. We we have a we look at okay, the graph is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Okay, we have another thing coming up. So <laughs> there's always a residue of vulnerabilities that we can't take care of, and that's a fact of life. Okay. I'm going to have a beer now. Thank you. <laughs>